Okay, this is <clears throat> Mr. Williams re-recording because apparently uh, the flip classroom I put on had no audio. So re-recording, um, this is book two, the second half of book two. Um, this is where Milton spends uh, most of his time creating the kind of intriguing allegory of the unholy trinity. Um, before we get into that, we have to just spend a minute or less making sure we understand the idea of the Holy Trinity. This is just an interesting uh, diagram I showed to attempt to describe it. Um, that there are three, Father, Son, and Spirit, or Holy Ghost, and yet they are one. It's, so it's a paradox that you know there's three and there's one. Is there three? there's one and there's three. Now Milton uses this structure to create the unholy trinity. Um, the allegory of unholy trinity essentially has Satan, sin, and death. Uh, Milton compares Satan, sin, and death to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the, the regular trinity or the theological trinity, Christian trinity, this is, these three figures, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, are unified by selfless love, um, essentially. And uh, St. Milton's allegory of the unholy trinity, these represent self-love and narcissism. Since we will see when sin tells of her birth out of Satan's head, that uh, after Satan began to find her attractive, Sin says, uh, what he found most attractive in me was my resemblance to him. And that's emphasizing the narcissism of it. So, um, try to, uh, you know, want to appreciate in the second half of uh, book two, Milton's aesthetic skill. Um, this is, you know, try to adopt a pre-blockbuster movie mindset. I mean, his imagination, Milton's, and his words conjured terrifying characters and events. And quickly through a summary of what happens, uh, Milton describes how Satan fearlessly approaches the two formidable shapes. This introduces the allegory. Um, Satan boldly announces his intention of passing through the gate. Um, death confronts the traitor angel. Notice that death knows that Satan has been a traitor. Um, death threatens to kill Satan, and Milton says, would have had he been allowed to. Uh, but it's a... It introduces Sin, who rushes between Satan, her begetter and lover, and death, her offspring. I know, ew, gross. A little bit more, uh, Satan is much more comforting and calming and soothing in her tone, uh, addressing Satan as her father, and asks the two not to fight. Um, now, Satan, interestingly, he doesn't recognize Sin, even though she's his offspring. So, I mean, this seems to have some psychological truth that, you know, sometimes people who commit grave deeds can have, you know, denial is not a river in Egypt, as they say. But sin does, in lines 246 through 814, recount her creation story. Uh, after her telling of the story, uh, Satan convinces sin and death that he's not their enemy, he is going to be their liberator, and says that if you allow me to pass through, I will promise you there will be more sin and more death in the universe. So again, that's um, an interesting, well-suited pairing of the allegory. The allegory pairs Milton's narrative purpose with his theological purpose quite well. For if Satan is allowed to leave through the gates of hell, he will bring sin and death into the world. 
And yes, lines 827 through 844 is where he is making that case. So death and sin are easily convinced. Although sin, you know, says I was told to guard this gate and given this key, but um, in lines uh, 850 through 857, she says, well, you're my dad, so I will go ahead and give you the key. They open the gates, and in lines 880 through 883, it says that they do not have the skill or the power to close them ever again. It's an ominous threat to uh, Milton's readers that the gates of hell are wide open, and if you don't do the right thing, you'll go there. I'm going to take you through some images um, of this great feat, the allegory of the unholy trinity. Um, you know, these are fulfilling the epic conventions of supernatural or superhuman characters in, you know, exotic, intriguing, far-off settings. Uh, Milton's doing this through his imagination. On the picture on the left, we see Satan right at the gates of hell. In this one, we can see uh, sin. And death does not seem nearly as menacing in this image as he does in some others. Uh, in the picture on the right, um, we've got a better picture of sin, clearly holding the key with the hellhounds around her middle, they being the result of death's raping her. Pretty awful. Not pretty, I mean, as awful as anything. Uh, we see a less clear image of death. Kind of looks emaciated, skeleton-like, and Satan seems to be off to the right in this image. Um, here's another one. You know, we say that uh, we see uh, Satan striking a more ponderous pose in this image with death looking ghouly in the back. Death with a crown, that's important. He, he is the king of hell, not Satan. Um, and sin, again, pictured with the key. And it looks like, in this case, blonde hair, which is kind of odd. Uh, Milton's implying that Satan, sin, and death are of one substance, essentially, in creating this allegory, just as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all of one substance in Christian theology. Um, this is what Milton is attempting to portray through this allegory. Now, death, born from the incestuous liaison of Satan and sin, um, that relationship, as I mentioned earlier, characterized by lust and narcissism, uh, and ultimately hate, rather than love. But death being the offspring becomes the bond between Satan and sin. Just as in Christian theology, the Holy Spirit is seen as some sort of a bond between father and son. Here's another image. Um, in this case, we have uh, sin narrating the moment of her birth. Um, you know, sin springs from out of uh, Satan's head. And this is, I suppose, the moment when the idea of rebellion, the idea of disobedience, the idea of sin emerges, manifest in a physical uh, being. And uh, Milton is credited with, through this allegory, of describing essentially a psychological truth about the idea of sin in characterizing the character sin. Like, just as rebel angels are frightened at the first sight of sin in heaven, uh, human beings often experience fear at the first thought of doing, say, naughty things. Um, just as sin is found attractive by Satan and is described as beautiful from the waist up, there are some Yusians who occasionally think of the fun that they can have if they're willing to break a few of the rules, if they're willing to do a little you know, naughty business. And just as sin is hideous from the waist down, although you can't really see that in this image, uh, humans often discover ugly consequences uh, when they do sin. Uh, and just as the hellhounds, which again aren't pictured in this one, but just as the hellhounds gnaw at the womb of sin, 
yet also cling to her. Uh, humans, when facing bitter consequences of their sinful or bad behavior, um, can experience a kind of remorse that gnaws away at their consciousness. So some, those are some of the ways that Milton is in his allegory seems to have struck upon some psychological truth of human nature in regards to sin. Uh, here is another image, uh, this one actually done by William Blake, who drew and painted um, many images. He was a huge fan. Um, in this case, I want to talk a little bit about the theological implications of Milton's allegory. Um, the way Milton tells it, only sin can open the gates of hell, and once she opens them, she can't close them. Now, this makes sense in the narrative, since she has the key, but theologically, hell c can't get to hell except through sin. Um, you now, it's sin and death, after Satan has passed through, it's sin and death that build the highway from hell to earth and their back. And again, theologically, that makes sense. Um, you know, Satan begets sin. So Satan is the temptation. Satan represents the temptation that leads to sin. And then it's sin that gives birth to death. Again, in Christian theology, sin leads to eternal death, which is separation from God in heaven. Death, in this case, we can see, see through him. He's translucent, but he's often described, and Milton describes him as formless, but with an insatiable appetite. Here's just another uh, image we see Satan looking, you know, quite militaristic and honorable and regal in this. Uh, death on the far right with the dart that would have killed Satan. Creating a bit of a paradox, if, if sin had not intervened, this is ironic, if sin had not intervened at this moment, the way Milton tells it, death would have killed Satan. And since sin comes from Satan, she wouldn't exist, and without her, he wouldn't exist. Uh, and yeah, kind of a gross depiction of, these, of this epic confrontation. In this case, we got uh, Satan on the right with the wings and the scepter, but uh, death on the far left. Looks like an old king. And, uh, oh gosh, sin. Um, again, sin's got that key around her waist. And in this case, it seems like she has uh, snake-like hair, conjuring ideas of Medusa. Here's a, another painting, this one by William Hogarth, of this epic confrontation. You know, as frequently, Satan is in some sort of armor, honorable. We see death as either skeleton-like or amorphous with a dart, and sin is always depicted uh, naked and coming between them. Uh, yet again. And <laughs> this is a funny one. Uh, kind of enjoy it. Uh, especially the rather amorphous depiction of uh, death over there. Again, he's got the crown. He is the king of uh, hell in Milton's depiction. So, to sum up, you know, what is Milton uh, suggesting about the concept of sin in his allegory, the way he characterizes sin? Well, from a creation story, we see that it's the idea of sin that needs to be uh, addressed and held accountable because it's the idea of sin that causes sin to spring from uh, Satan's mind. Um, and I've talked quite a bit already about the relationship with Satan and death, creating this unholy trinity. Um, her physical description, how she's initially received and treated, certainly f filled with um, some psychological truth, but also some misogynistic ideas. Uh, and I want to talk about from her suffering is perhaps Milton's unintended consequences. Um, when you read Sin's account of what her life is like, 
it's hard from, I think, from a 21st century perspective to not find her a sympathetic character since she has done nothing. She in herself has done nothing wrong to suffer this. This is before she opens the gates of hell. She suffers terribly simply by being who she is. You know, in 21st century, we kind of usually adopt the idea of, you know, if you are who you are, we should accept that. Um, but Milton's casting of her as a character who suffers greatly can, I think, undermine his theological implications or theological purpose. Um, I already talked about her action at the gates of hell. Although it's worth noting, why did God give her the key? Um, next time you see him, we ask him that. And then just to kind of wrap it up in terms of uh, the other part of the allegory of unholy trinity, in terms of death from his creation story, I mean, death is insatiable. Death wants to consume. Death wants to kill. And uh, that, I suppose, is what many in uh, many human beings, I suppose in the West especially, come to fear death, even those that are Christian with a belief in an afterlife. And theologically, of course, it's through sin, which comes from Satan, that one can lead to eternal death or, you know, death in hell. So um, I think that's it. I'm going to wrap it up and say goodbye.